So I'm Jeremy Adler. I'm the immediate past president of CAPA, and it's been a very exciting time over the last year. We've had a very important piece of legislation, SB 337, pass. And as a result, though, this brought up a lot of discussions about PAs, about our profession, and who we are. Really, when we start talking about things in this bill that have to do with co-signatures, have to do with supervision of PAs, it really brought to light the opinions of many of the other healthcare providers, professional associations, and others who have an interest in what we do. And I got very different messages. I even had different messages from amongst my peers. So PAs had different views as to who we are and what we should do. Let me give you an example. When talking about co-signatures, is it important that you sign 1%, 3%, 5%, 10 charts, 50 charts, 100 charts? What is considered adequate when it comes to making sure that PAs provide safe and high quality care? Or how often should you meet? How often should you discuss? How long should you discuss? These issues were a lot of the topics of discussion when we're looking at the way that PAs are utilized in the workforce. And I certainly came to this with my own viewpoints, but I found that others didn't always share my viewpoints. So I'm gonna take the opportunity this morning to talk about our profession and what I really believe is our responsibility in taking control of it because I don't think anybody else out there is gonna serve us the way that we should be serving ourselves. So the topic here is define ourselves carefully or others will carelessly, and I do believe that. It is our responsibility, each of us, to be a part of this. Now this is a text poll uh, morning session, so therefore if you have your phone, please take it out. You all should have phones, I imagine. And you can use the event app or you can text poll. If you happen to have this, if you were here yesterday, then you can go ahead and text poll because it won't let you use the, uh, the app. But if you have the app, go to the agenda in the app, go to polls, and you'll be able to participate. And if you text poll, the ID for this program is 79905, and then there are numbers for each of the questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started with the first question just to make sure it's working and everybody can play along. Question one, the PA profession is deserving of its recognition as one of the best careers in the country. So please go ahead and key in your results. Okay, I see the numbers starting to go up, working out some of the kinks. All right, we'll go ahead and move on. Hopefully by the next, we'll, uh, it'll get even a little bit easier. So let's take a look here. Question two, PAs see only simple medical cases. You, you laugh. Go ahead and key your answer into this. Okay. You know, it's interesting. I, I think that the message that has gone out is that that is what we do, that we see simple cases. And the reality is, I don't see simple cases. And I look at this and I say to myself, I'm not alone. PAs provide a high level of service in many different environments. And part of what the other professions see us doing, though, is potentially freeing up the physicians, right? It's all about the physician. We make it so that they can handle the complex cases. PAs are providing a vital service within our healthcare system. And to me, that's a very important message we need to communicate. Because especially when you start talking about the relationship between physicians and PAs, if the concept is PAs are only seeing simple cases, PAs are assistants. Topic of my discussion here is are we merely assistants? This is really an important uh, concept that I think we need to break down. So what is an assistant? This is an old word, it doesn't, uh, you know, it's uh, originally taking one stand beside. It's a person whose job it is to help another person do work. It's a helper, second in command, aid, apprentice, junior, auxiliary, subordinate. How well does that define what it is that we do? Now, we all got into this profession knowing this was our professional title, and I know that there's lots of discussions about the correct name to capture what it is that we do. Although in some respect, it's kind of like buying a home near an airport and then complaining about noise, right? We knew this. So what the bigger concept to me is not so much what we're called, but what it is that we provide. And this is what kept coming up to me during our process when we start talking about supervision in our relationship. You know, are we a professional or are we technicians? Key distinction, if we're professionals, 
then I believe we should be able, as professionals, to work with other healthcare professionals to decide how it is we provide our services. So instead of saying, well, there, you need to you know, have five charts signed or 100 charts signed, let the professionals figure out how to practice their profession. Because somebody in the beginning of their career is different than somebody who's been in their career a long time. Somebody who's changing a career is different than somebody who's been in the same area of medicine. So as professionals, and I believe we are professionals, that's certainly why I got into this, it is important that we convey that. Now, I will argue that a lot of, us, a lot of people do view us as technicians, that we need to be told exactly how to do what and when. You know, which form we need to fill out to document how we do certain things. We need to have very strict regimented um, practice uh, uh, protocols in terms of, you know, you do this, then you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this, because we're not professional enough to decide this as a profession. This really did come out during the uh, working of our bill, and it's something to me that is really vital that we need to shift this towards professionals. We are a healthcare profession. I think we're a vital healthcare profession and really move away from this kind of more technical assistant extender of the physician type of model that I think has been promoted. This kind of mid-level concept, got to move away. So at CAPA, we've done a couple of things. Um, first of all, we have a definition of the PA role. I think it's really important that you actually hear what it is we've defined. So PAs are health professionals, health professionals, licensed or in the case of those employed by the federal government, credentialed to practice medicine in collaboration with physicians. Some very strong language there. Okay, we are a health profession. We are an independent health profession. Okay, doesn't mean we practice independently, but as a profession, we provide services that are unique to us. PAs are qualified by their graduation from accredited PA educational program and certification from NCCPA. Within the physician PA relationship, PAs provide patient centered medical care services as a member of a healthcare team. So we do absolutely embrace the concept of team. We're not out there doing our own thing. PAs practice with defined levels of autonomy and exercise independent medical decision making within their scope of practice. And that to me is really powerful. And that is what we do every day. We are delegated because we work with physicians who have a individual understanding of our unique education, experience, and competence that delegate to us the ability to make independent decision making. Okay, there's not a physician in the room of every patient seen by a PA every single time. That's not how this whole system was set up. So that's where it really comes down to this practice level determination, which really has to do with our professionalism. Because if we're not professionals, then that really this whole system doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. Okay, question. I chose PA because it offers many benefits in terms of time of education, cost of education, employment availability, and career flexibility. Okay, it looks like most of you agree with that. I wasn't asking anything too, uh, too radical there. I do think we come to this with a variety of, uh, of backgrounds. How about this? I chose PA because I specifically feel I lack the capacity to be a physician. So interesting, right? So here we are, we, we've established that we don't see simple cases, that we have uh, delegated to us independent decision making in medical care, we function fairly autonomously, and we are professionals. And we didn't choose this because we couldn't choose another profession. We chose this profession for a variety of reasons. I look at my background. So I grew up in a family where my father was a physician. I grew up always knowing I would go into medicine. It was very easy. I have a brother who was always struggling with really what to do. Nothing really grabbed his passion. For me, from day one, it was always medicine. And it was my father, really, who encouraged me to consider PA. He said, look, I spent you know, four years in medical school. I spent four years or three years in his residency. He did a fellowship. He's an endocrinologist. He's an expert in his field. He's a, you know, a profession, highly trained, top of his uh, game. And he sees a patient, and he's told, nope, you can't do that. And he said, why? Why? Why did I spend all that money, spend all that time, sacrifice seeing my kids uh, grow up? Why did I invest all that to be basically unable to practice my, my trade, my profession? It's like, if you want to do it, choose PA. And I still hem and hawed. And then I ended up working in an emergency room while I was in college with a PA who functioned incredibly well and um, really impressed me. And between the two of them, I, my dad and this PA, I decided this is what I was going to do. But I said, I want to go where that PA went. 
he happened to go to uh, SUNY Stony Brook, so I went to New York, and that's where I had my PA training. But while I was there, I kept thinking in the back of my head, did I choose the easy path? Was this somehow because I really didn't feel I could, I could do medicine? So I struggled a lot with that. And my second year, my second, or not my second year, my second semester, I actually took a Kaplan course and took MCATs because I just needed to know that this was not a, a choice based on, on really the, the capacity aspect. And I was happy with my score. At that point, I said, you know what? The PA is the right profession, and I haven't looked back. And it really is an amazing profession. You guys, I'm sure, just like myself, I think all of you at the beginning here strongly agreed pretty much with this being such a really amazing uh, profession, an amazing time in the profession. OK, changing the professional name to physician associate is the solution. This certainly is a topic of discussion uh, on a national level. <laughs> well, it's a pretty uh, fair split there between uh, different opinions. You know, this is a, a discussion that uh, I've thought a lot about, especially during this last year when we've been talking about so much of our, our, our bill and, and supervision and co-signatures and, and whether or not we're professionals or technician. And I don't believe you change the name that all of a sudden everything just follows it. You know, I talk to uh, PAs in this process, and there are PAs out there who say, you know, they far swing one side. They say we should be able to do everything and anything, anytime, and, and none of the restrictions should be in place. And other PAs say, I am comforted. It's like a warm blanket around me knowing that my physician has to look at certain charts by regulation and by law. So even amongst ourselves, there's a lot of different opinions about this. I think it's more important than our name that we really define who it is and what we do. And we need to tell people what we do, because right now we're getting defined externally, and that's why there's so many different opinions about us. Okay, if PAs all decided that for one week they would not work, the healthcare system in California would collapse. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. So I, tr I went out to New York, I went uh, to Long Island. And in New York, the healthcare system is quite a bit different than it is here in California. It's very hospital-based. But one of the things that I saw is it's very PA-based. One of the hospitals I did my ER rotation uh, currently has 150 employed PAs within that hospital. It's not a very big hospital. And my whole, uh, uh, there were intensivist PAs that ran the ICU. The OR was run by PAs. It was a model in which if PAs didn't go, the system doesn't function. They weren't this auxiliary service or this kind of nice benefit or freed up the physicians to, to do something. They were a vital component of the system, and that was the model that I saw. And then coming back to California, I saw it very different. When I started practicing, I wanted to provide services at our local hospital, so I do pain, so I wanted to uh, do surgical procedures, actually, as a first assist, putting in things like uh, implantable morphine pumps and stimulators and the hospital looked at me like, we have we never had a PA in our service. We, we really don't know what to do with you. It took me three years to get on to staff. And I had just come from a model in New York where these entire systems were built on a foundation of PAs. So I see a lot of opportunity for us, but there's still a lot of work done. And a lot of hospitals, you know, the emergency rooms now, I'm starting to see PAs. But it's not nearly the same as what we see uh, in other parts of the, uh, the country. So I thought, well, maybe it's because California has different PA students, right? I mean, we as a professional organization at CAPA can change the legislative and regulatory environment to make practice more desirable here in this state, but we don't pick who is entering into PA programs, right? We don't control the, the, the influx of new PAs into our profession. So I had the opportunity when the AAPA was in San Francisco to talk to a number of different program directors at different programs, and I said, well, what do you ask students? Right? I mean, this is something to me It was kind of interesting. And I, I found that there was a different approach. And I kind of summarized them here. The second one I stole almost verbatim. Um, but the first one, what do you think here when interviewing potential PA students, which statement is most appropriate? One, you understand that PAs are not physicians and you have to be comfortable deferring to their clinical decision making. 
Do not bother applying unless you are comfortable deferring these decisions. Or two, it's 2 a.m., you are in the ICU, the decision you make in the next 60 seconds determines if the patient lives or dies. Do not bother applying unless you are comfortable making these decisions. So I'll let you go ahead and key those in. Again, those outside of our profession would not know we would answer this way. I'm pretty confident in that from the discussions that I've had. But here we are, we've established that we are delegated independent decision making, we don't just see simple cases overwhelmingly, and now we're talking about life and death decisions in the ICU in the middle of the night. This is not the image our profession has here in California. It's things that I think we need to move towards and a lot of work needs to be done, and certainly is happening. So I want you to think for a moment about your own practice and just see here which of the following introductions closely represents how you introduce yourself to patients. So first, hello, I am John Smith, physician assistant. Hello, I am John Smith, a physician assistant working under Dr. Jones. Hello, I am PA Smith with Dr. Jones. Hello, I am John Smith, a PA with Acme Med. Hello, I am Dr. Jones's physician assistant, John Smith. All right, so almost 80% of you went with Jane Smith. Uh, the first one, uh, which was, uh, hello, I am John Smith, physician assistant. Okay, we're gonna come back to that. Oh, I think I went back to the same one. Okay, anybody know what this is? I had a, <laughs> all right, I planted him in the audience. That's right, a stem cell, at least it's supposed to be. Last year at our conference, uh, Larry Herman uh, came out from AAPA and did a presentation for us, and he said that PAs are the stem cells of medicine, and to me that resonated incredibly well. And what he was saying is that essentially we are hole fillers in the healthcare system. Whatever need needs to be taken care of, a PA can do it. And this is something that we uniquely own, meaning that if a system needs primary care providers, we can do that. If tomorrow they need specialists, we can do that too. And we can do it without additional education and without additional certification. And we can do it in any area of medicine. Physicians can't do that. Nurse practitioners can't do that. No other healthcare profession can do what we can do. And I think that is something we need to own. That is a necessary part of our system as well and something we shouldn't forget. You know, it's 2017 for me is coming up. That's when I have to take the pannery. Okay. I've been in practice since 1999, and I've only done Pathway 2. There's probably some of you here that don't even know what I'm talking about, but I've only done Pathway 2. So, you know, the pantry is a little intimidating considering I've been in a specialty practice my entire career. I still think it is vital, though, that we maintain a general medical certification because that gives us that flexibility in the workforce to fill these needs. Because although I've done pain management since then, I could do cardiology tomorrow if, the need, if, if we needed it. Now, Within our profession, there's a lot of division there. We're starting to th see things like CAQs, right? The Certificate of Added Qualification. A lot of people want recognition. Like, if I do orthopedics, I want recognition for what I do. I can tell you, I would love to take a pain exam. To me, that seems so less intimidating and rewarding and probably more meaningful for my patients than taking primary care. But I think if we go that path, then what we're doing is we're mimicking the physicians. And what we're gonna see is that job availability, essentially, will then be restricted to those that have the specific certification. And we're gonna lose the thing that we as PAs own, and that is flexibility. So I just want you to at least keep that in mind. I also wanna introduce the concept of necessary and complementary. We are necessary in this system. Again, no other profession has that flexibility. And we complement other health professions. We don't mimic them, we're not in their shadows. We're not you know, halfway up to a physician like a mid-level or, or somewhere between a doctor and a nurse. We are our own profession, we complement other professions, but we are necessary in the workplace. What I felt like in New York was that a PA was a pillar in the system. That's something that I've been talking to the other leaders at Kappa about now for a long time and during my uh, presidency, one of my priorities was to move us in that direction. Um, at Kappa, we have worked really hard to try to establish our profession to the best of our ability. This is not something that happens overnight, but really to try to create the sense that PAs are a pillar in this system. We have a vision at Kappa, which is to fully integrate PAs into every aspect of California's healthcare. 
Every single time that I have come up to the lectern at, a, uh, at the conference last year and in Napa, these came out of my mouth. Um, Roy said it uh, yesterday. We've been trying to push this concept. We need to be in every aspect of California's healthcare. Now, that's not meaning that we need to be here just in leadership at CAPA or within uh, PA education or within, within our own ranks, but we need to be into every single aspect. We need to be at hospital systems, on committees. We need to be in government. We need to be in elected office. We need to be in state committees. We need to be everywhere. There should not be a healthcare decision made in this state that a PA doesn't have a voice as a part of it. I can tell you right now that is, that is, not, uh, that is not happening. And that's not something that CAPA can do internally, but we really need everybody to be involved. Now, with the bill, we were very excited. We sent out a request for letters to the governor, and we got over uh, 1,300 or 1,400 letters from our members. So those mean something. When those stack of letters come into the governor's office, they pay attention to that we are serious about what it is that we do. So we've done a couple of things in the organization. Some of it maybe you've seen, some of it you haven't. When you walk around, you might see it today after I present this to you. First of all, we've established that within our profession, PA is the appropriate name. There is no translation. We're not physician assistants, we are PAs, okay? How many of you work for CEP America? Some of you, okay. So CEP America used to be here in California. It was California Emergency Physicians. Well, that became a little problematic when they went national. So now they're just CEP America. And there's been lots of other organizations that have branded an acronym for their organization. For example, ARC used to be the Association for Retarded Children. Now they're just ARC. Um, you have uh, organizations like um, CCS uh, is a uh, health plan. Uh, used to uh, be uh, Crippled Children's Services. So now it's CCS, you know, KFC. <laughs> um, we felt that it was important that we own PA, and if we tell people who we are and we act as professionals, that's an acronym already out there. We don't have to change any law, anything, and that can be implemented today. We also changed the name of our organization. We're no longer the California Academy of Physician Assistants. We're now the California Academy of PAs. And if you look at your conference badges, if you look at all of the signage, you will not find the word assistant uh, within our uh, profession. We realize we have to change the banner over the, uh, the pool, but uh, it's a process. <laughs> we also, in our print material, so Kappa News, our website, to the best of our ability, we've removed uh, assistant uh, and physician assistant from all of our print material. Uh, when we get up to the mic, when we uh, testify uh, at the Capitol, we're from the California Academy of PAs. What we're finding is that those that need to know who we are, when we say PA, they know who we are. We also changed our mission uh, this last year. Uh, the mission of the California Academy of PAs is to represent and serve PAs statewide as an advocate of its members for the provision of quality health care, and this is really the key part, in collaboration with all health care professionals. Capital will enhance, educate, and empower PAs for the ultimate benefit of their patients. They used to say working with physicians, a unique relationship with physicians. We realize PAs just don't work with physicians. We really do work with all health care providers. And that is another key point as well that talks about us as an independent health profession. Again, not independent in practice, but we are a profession. Professional leadership, don't find fault, find a remedy. Again, to reinforce, to change this, to change the direction of our profession, we need to be involved, we need to be at the table, we need to have a voice. And that's gonna take all of us. And in different places, in different hospitals, in different practices, at very different levels, it's all important. Kappa is trying uh, to advance uh, all the time, and we are involved in a number of different um, policy groups. Uh, these are just some of them here, and we've been involved in some things like Cures Program, where at every single medical board and PAB uh, meeting, we're in a number of uh, workforce uh, uh, groups. These are ways to get the PA voice out, and before that really didn't exist. There was no PA voice at the uh, table. So going back here, how would you now, maybe, not, maybe nothing has changed, but think about how you might ideally introduce yourself to patients. Think about what language may be most uh, important, because I can tell you that words matter. That's yeah, a little bit different. Okay, so what do I think? You know, I talked about the leadership at a variety of different levels. I do think that we should adopt a PA. I think we should be moving toward an introduction that is more nationally uh, 
focus, but defines who we are immediately to patients. To me, the simplest would just be to be PA last name. So I could just be PA Adler when I meet a patient, and they would immediately know who I was. I wouldn't have to get into a uh, discussion about that. I do think we need to keep our general medical education and our medical certification as something that we own and be very uh, cautious about loosening up on, on that. I think that we need to certainly support uh, policy groups, support uh, our organizations like CAPA trying to advance our profession in certain areas. We need to um, basically think of our profession again as a, a profession as a default. And I say that for things like forms. We get calls where people say, well, can I sign this form? My feeling is the default should be that you can. We're a health professional. And then only until we're not, then we got to figure out why and then change it. We recently got approval to sign post forms. That was a bill that passed this year, so for end of life. And what to me is so exciting about that is not that we can sign a form. It's that as PAs, we can have a very important discussion with our patients about how they want to you know, have the end of their life cared for. And we can sign that with our signature, that is valid. There is no co-signature. That is not reviewed by somebody else. We are, have the ability through our profession to provide that type of important information uh, or those discussions with patients. So I ask you a final question here, personal question. I will do my part to advance the PA profession as necessary and complementary in California's healthcare system. Well, thank you for coming out this morning. Thank you for listening to me and participating in the poll. And with that, we're going to go ahead and get our CME event started for today. So thank you.